Okay, everyone. Hey, welcome back to the session. Uh, we'll resume from where we stopped off. Uh, where we stopped at page 21 uh, in your PDFs. Okay, we're discussing about elders. Um, and one of the things that I missed uh, mentioning, which I wanted to, was, uh, you know, the word elder itself, right? Uh, I mean, we discussed that it's from the Greek word called presbyter, means uh, elderly, older, a senior, or an elder of age, okay? Um, that also explains, now, this is the studies also say that uh, these people uh, were new in their faith, very young in their faith, uh, but older in age and maturity, and hence they were called as elders, okay? So they were new to their faith, obviously, right, because they were from different regions. They're hearing the Gospels for the first time, and the church is being planted, and they're taking care of all these things. So they must have been very young in their faith, uh, but older in age and maturity, uh, wiser in, in maturity, right? So that's another thing to consider when we talk about uh, elders. So once again, uh, we see uh, the birth of the early church, uh, leaders, leaders taking over, and then we see deacons, a team of people working together. Uh, and then we saw the emergence of leaders uh, to basically pastor a group of people, you know, given the responsibility of uh, guiding their flock, shepherding their flock. Uh, and all of these teams, uh, you know, they they work together as one, right? Uh, the people from different teams. Like we see Paul and Barnabas that, as an example, uh, working together as one. And then we see that the team of Paul and Barnabas kind of grows, right? Uh, Simeon, Lucius, Mananin, uh, at the bottom of page 21, you can see the, their names being mentioned from Acts chapter 11 and Acts chapter 13. That's two years later after Paul and Barnabas um, you know, serve together in ministry, going on mission trip, uh, trip and whatnot. We see more people being added to it, right? Uh, but that's the beauty of the local church. Um, this one one thing that I'll probably uh, I'm teaching worship ministry as well for the final years. Um, one thing we discuss in that uh, subject is the difference between a band and uh, and the and the local church worship team. Okay, local church worship team, uh, the difference between the band and the local church worship team. One of the things that we emphasize is um, a band is, uh, is, is inclusive and, and the local church worship team is exclusive. The band says, um, us four and no more. Right, uh, but uh, the, the local church worship team is, is open, uh, you know, for people of, uh, you know, different age uh, and, and whatnot. A band can be, it could just be a boy band or a girl band, you know, all girl band, all boy band and whatnot. But the local church worship team is not like that, right? It's it's rich in diversity. It can be multicultural. And that's exactly what happens here in the church, in the early church, is that this team was a multicultural team, right? It was rich in diversity. Um, Right. Um, it says so Barnabas was an ex Levitical priest. Uh, Saul was highly educated in Judaism. Um, Manain was brought up in the courts of King Herod. Lucius was from Cyrene, north of Libya. Right. So talk about multicultural uh, team, the diversity in the team, and the knowledge and the experience and the exposure each each individual would have had. Uh, it's just wonderful, isn't it? Um, and that's how the church even nowadays we function together is people from all different kinds of backgrounds. Uh, you know, even just us here in this classroom, uh, we we have people from different backgrounds, right? Different uh, cultures, different country, right? Um, and we can get a certain thing done if we work together as a team, isn't it, guys? And so that's how they functioned, uh, right? So a group of elders and whatnot. And now moving on from there, uh, as again, remember, we are talking about uh, the growth of, uh, of, the, of, of the early church, right? How they're growing in maturity, in spiritual maturity, how they are growing as Christians uh, in their faith and whatnot. Uh, now, elders was, say, at two or more group of people considered elders, right? They were in charge of 
taking care of a local church. But as the church matures, now, okay, to come to an understanding, it's better to have one person who oversees the entire local church and everybody else can come under that one leader, one, one primary leader, okay? The deacons, the elders, um, the apostles, or whoever, right? They would all uh, report <laughs> to the senior leader, okay, uh, of the church. And we see that happening in, in the early church of Jerusalem, uh, where James, in chapter 15, you can read about in Acts chapter 15, uh, although the church had, uh, you know, spiritual leaders like elders um, and deacons and whatnot, uh, the final decision uh, at council would, was taken by James, right? So although the Church of Jerusalem had all these uh, board members uh, and whatnot, the final decision was taken by James. Uh, and then later, uh, we see that Timothy is being appointed as pastor of the local church um, at Ephesus. And you can read about it, we, we, about about in First Timothy chapter one verse three, uh, where Paul says, "Hey, you you stay there. You take care of that church. Uh, you protect them. You, uh, you 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 protect them from all the false doctrines that can be preached over there. Uh, so you guide them. Uh, you take care of them and and whatnot, right? So Timothy is being appointed as a pastor of a local church, one person to as an overseer of the entire church. And then later, in you know, in the book of Revelation, we see uh, seven letters being addressed to." Jesus addressing, right? Uh, it talks about, uh, and to the angel of this church, uh, you know, he said this. Uh, what is very important for us, uh, this could just be like a simple word study uh, for, under, for us to understand the text better, is that uh, in the book of Revelations, when we read, uh, you know, that, that he addressed to us the angel of a certain church, uh, the Greek word simply means angelos, right? It simply means messenger. That's what it is. Okay, so again, they are used interchangeably, right? So, um, okay, hold on. Sorry. Okay, so uh, angels are are also considered as God's messengers, isn't it? Uh, you know, when Gabriel has to come to deliver a message and whatnot, so he is a messenger. That's what he's doing. What he's uh, he's known to do, uh, so to speak. But then also, um, vice versa. Uh, you know. A person who delivers a message message is also known as an angel. Okay, what sets it apart? Where, why it's important? Where it's important for us to uh, make this distinction is, is just read the whole context. Okay, now obviously Jesus is not uh, you know addressing uh, and to an angelic being uh, for several reasons. Uh, one thing is nowhere in the New Testament we see that okay angel. Gabriel, uh, you know, you go take care of this local church. We don't see that happening, right? An angelic being, this is what I'm talking about, right? An angelic being is not given a responsibility to take care of a local church on this earth, right? So that's, I think it sets the record straight that when uh, Jesus is saying, uh, you know, this is what he said to the angel of a certain church, he's talking to the leader appointed uh, of a church, right? Of, of a church there. Okay, are you all with me? Yeah. So, uh, and we see another advanced thing that happens there is so the local church at Ephesus progressed from having elders, right? From Acts chapter 20, verse 17, it progressed from having elders to having one senior leader. Okay, so that's the emergence of a senior leader or pastor, pastors. Okay, um, so in a local church, uh, elders, deacons, uh, and other fivefold ministries, which we will just uh, go through, uh, coexist, right? So in one local church, elders, deacons, and other fivefold ministries, people involved uh, who are called for this fivefold ministry, they coexist and they function together under the leadership of a, a senior leader. Okay, but uh, this one interesting thing right uh, about you now we know about synagogues uh, the, during the time of jesus you know we read a lot about synagogues uh, you know in the gospels um, 
so the origin of these synagogues basically is a small group kind of a meeting right like a life group meeting or cell group meeting or whatnot um the origin of that dates back all the way again historians scholars say this is uh when the, the israelites the jews were taken into exile by the babylons babylonians Right when King Nebuchadnezzar um, marches into um, Israel, destroys the temple built by Solomon, and they and they take them for exile, uh, right for seventy odd years, right for seventy years or so. Now until then, the temple uh, was let's say it was their local church, right? It, it it was very important. It was very very special. It was a common meeting place. That's where everybody met. Uh, it was. Uh, for uh, everything spiritual related and now that the temple was being destroyed was destroyed and they are in a they are all strangers in a strange land or foreigners in a foreign land they do not have a common place of worship uh, they do not have a common meeting place uh, right they did not have any uh, and so that's when in a foreign place they decided okay let's meet in small groups in different people's houses uh, now, just as how we see the church in the first century matured and progressed, grew, those small group meetings that began in that exile uh, progressed, grew in maturity, took its full form, and then later we see it became uh, be known as a synagogue. Okay, uh, and then because the early church uh, Christians, uh, they were still Jews. Okay, yeah, they were Christians, but they were still Jews, right? Uh, messianic Jews as we, as we would call it now because they believed in Jesus but they were still Jews so they practiced the same traditions uh, of the Jews like they would meet they would go to the temple right they would uh, meet in synagogues for prayer chant uh, hymns and to one another and whatnot um, but more about this next year okay but uh, we see how the progression is so similar okay and that's why I wanted to share that uh, is the progression is so similar when you draw a parallel Okay, um, let's take a look at page 23 in the fivefold ministries and team ministry. One of the outstanding features we see in the book of Acts is team ministry. Okay, hey, how many of you are, uh, like functioning in a team? And how many of you don't like functioning in a team? Be honest. like functioning in a team jb says okay no lone rangers here <laughs> i don't like a partner i like to work alone i do my things my way hey nobody's going to crucify you if you say that okay so it's okay i'm just just a genuine question <laughs> where well, there we have it Oh, Georgia. Oh, Georgia. No, <laughs> Frostland's getting very specific. I like to function in a like minded team. It sounds like fun. Yeah, I, I still haven't come across a team that's like like-minded. They all had to be beaten into shape to be like-minded. <laughs> Eventually, we get there. Cool, cool. Yeah, uh, I think uh, yeah, but working in, working in a team is um, yeah, it has its pros and cons, right? I mean, because people are different. Uh, you know, we for now we use this. Uh, we use the names Paul, Barnabas, uh, but we forget that they were actual people, right? Paul, Barnabas, James, Peter. They were all not just not names hanging around in a cloud or something. They are all individuals, right? Uh, they have their own individual traits, just like how, you know, how many of us are there? We are 13 of us. So if you leave me out, there are 12. So that, yeah, we, we have 12 people in the class. Yeah, how symbolic is that? Uh, are you guys ready to go and change the world? Right. So we have Prezi, JP, Jeffina, Zilatoli, uh, George, uh, Anita, Roslyn, uh, Abu, and and all of you are not just names. It's just people, right? Real people with the, your own characteristics. You 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 have your own likes and dislikes. You know, your favorite colors. Um, you know some of the some of you are extroverts. Some of you are introverts, and all of whatnot, isn't it? 
all of that kind of makes kind of a team uh, a team will have all these characters you know we use those word no it's like dude there's this one character in the team dude you know he or she is one character only dude it, <laughs> it's what it is right they are real characters their team is made up of so many different characters but then something about coming together in unity uh you know and i i read about this somewhere it stayed with me unity doesn't necessarily mean uniformity uh okay unity doesn't necessarily mean a uniformity okay so and hence we get the word university there because there's unity in diversity right um and what, one common thing from the early church and also going back to the old testament sometimes we see in the book of chronicles uh is first chronicles 16 you, you when you read you see okay all the priests and everybody uh they gather together in one heart in one mind they raise their voice in one uh, as one they played together as one they sang as one and in acts chapter 2 we see that they they were gathered together in one accord that means in one heart and one mind uh that means the, they were united uh, there's always power and i think functioning and working together uh, looking at the bigger picture that saying okay hey it's not about me it's about the vision and the mission of what we as a team are called to accomplish uh you know when we get that idea of a bigger picture uh, then god loves a good team isn't it and so it seems like these people got the idea of it uh and one of that is uh, a church in antioch right we see that uh, the church of antioch is an interesting case study so let's study their case and here are some important lessons uh, we can draw from the antioch church okay uh, once again antioch is a modern day turkey uh, south of turkey uh, just for your reference so the local church is a place where ministries are to be birthed everybody say amen type in amen okay the local church is a place where ministries are to be birthed equipped and released okay it's beautiful it's beautiful okay uh, all ministries fivefold ministries and others need to be rooted in a local church for spiritual refreshing and accountability all ministers pastors elders deacons other fivefold ministries and other believers coexist and function together in a local church it sounds very scary isn't it <laughs> all ministers okay all pastors elders deacons uh, it's it sounds like a, a, a recipe for disaster <laughs> uh, but all ministers pastors elders deacons other fivefold ministries and other believers coexist and function together in a local church complementing supporting and enriching the local body uh, without competing with each other and i can say another amen there okay without competing uh what's behind the spirit of competing jealousy a bitterness uh you know uh, entitlement it's like oh why does she get to sing all the time why can't i sing you know, yada 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 all this kind of a thing right the calling and ministry of some people will require them to go out to the world or to the body of christ at large whereas others may be called to minister within their local church body and which is fine right so uh, this is just a very simple quick case study and you can study in depth uh, about uh, the church at antioch and if you want to i think it'll, it'll help you in some ways right guys um all good okay 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 so now here this is where we get into uh a more uh, more information regarding the modern day uh, structures of the church, uh, right? Uh, from where we were and everything that we discussed, and what we're about to discuss uh, is uh, worlds apart. Okay, uh, 
from being one church, uh, being uh, working together as one team and whatnot, and it's now suddenly we have different forms uh, of church structure, right? So uh, the idea of this section is to just emphasize or encourage that use a structure that works best for your church. It's not to say this is the best structure or this section is not to say, uh, you know, Hey, this structure is uh, better than this, uh, you know, what they're doing is wrong and whatnot, right? Uh, but I think what is the goal of a church is a mission is what? Great commission. Right? We continue to go into all the world. We continue to equip, our, equip the saints, empower them, uh, right? Uh, until like what it says in uh, you know, Ephesians 4.13, till everyone reaches maturity. Right, that's that's the goal, and the forms and structures, the methods and whatnot. Jesus only didn't give, uh, be, you know, when he ascended before he ascended. So, who are we to say, you know? <laughs> so, just pick one and uh, move on. But this is uh, look at the different forms. Okay, the first one is the clerical system in the church structure. The clerical system, so like a clergy. It's uh, like what does the clergy mean? Uh, the body of people ordained for religious duties right uh, in, especially in a christian church we see we see that clergy happening right uh, it, all marriages were supposed to be solemnized by the clergy um, all funerals uh, you know were supposed to be uh, you know handed by uh, with, the, with the responsibility of a clergy and whatnot so uh, that's what it simply means so mainline traditional denominations uh, just to name a few, uh, Anglican, Methodist, Baptist, uh, and so on. Uh, they kind of follow this system, right, denomination. So I was having a conversation with a friend who's uh, doing his theological studies elsewhere. He was studying about church history, and, and uh, he mentioned uh, there, are, there are over 40,000 denominations uh in the world uh, you know yeah <laughs> uh yeah you heard me right for the thousand what we know what we know is anglican methodist baptist lutherans uh you know pentecostals and whatnot but then forty thousand, i can't get my head around it uh, but then as shocked as i am i am not surprised um, there are a lot of factors that can be taken into consideration, isn't it? Like uh, geographical, uh, you know, setting, the cultural setting, the language, uh, the traditions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's just to name a few, right? Um, so, yeah, mainline traditional denominations. Uh, distinction between the clergy and laity. Uh, laity is consists of all members who are not part of the clergy. Okay, so if, yeah, like if a church has a, a, a clergy, like their leadership team uh, who've been appointed to be part of the clergy, and everyone who's part of the congregation are considered as laity. Okay, so that's just the distinction. Uh, most of the work is done by the clergy. The local parish clergy are under the control of the hierarchical structure about them. Okay, so this is where I'm going to request you to just follow along with me in your notes, okay? So we, as we go through these things so there is a hierarchy a control right so um like what we saw okay so there's a senior pastor there are deacons uh, elders and whatnot uh, there are different teams but who will work together as one but then here there's a hierarchy okay so usually there are there is a threefold order bishops priests and deacons that's the hierarchy so that's the clerical system um, then we have the elders system led by a group of elders. Okay, one of the denominations that I can think of, I'm not entirely sure, but then I know a bunch of friends uh, from this denomination who do, do not have a pastor, like one senior leader, but they have a group of uh, elders who lead. Uh, one of the denominations, I think Brotherins is one of them. Um, Brotherins, yeah, uh, led by a group of elders. Um, and has shown reasonable success in establishing good local churches. Uh, their cooperative leadership in some cases may cause difficulty in casting a single vision. 
right? In which case progress could become sluggish or stifled. However, when there is unity and consensus, team leadership becomes powerful. Okay, team leadership. No, it all it all comes down to um, the vision of the team. It's not a vision of a single person. Um, it has it its own advantages and disadvantages, its own pros and cons and whatnot. But then, in conclusion, when the, when there is unity and consensus, okay, uh, everybody is uh, agreeing to what they want to see accomplished through this church, then team leadership becomes powerful. So that's the elder system, where a church is led by a group of elders, right? But we see in the first church, local church, uh, how the church uh, progressed and matured from being led by a group of elders to having one senior leader, uh, you know, who's uh, the overseer over everything. Uh, independent local churches led by individual pastors with pastoral team. Uh, plenty of room for vision, creativity, and growth. Plenty of room for vision, creativity, and growth. Um, however, danger of Totality, uh, totalitarianism. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's a mouthful. That word. Okay, dicto uh, dictatorial leadership, which can be very harmful. Uh, so, what's the meaning of totalitarianism? Uh, it's like, it's, I mean, it's like dictatorship, but uh, it's like a system of government that is kind of, you know, uh, it says, okay, you have to obey. You know, uh, it's something very similar to uh, what China has going on now, and North 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 Korea has going on now, in, in a certain season, uh, Russia, and you know, almost like communists. Like, and then you know, you can think when you think of dictatorship, you can think of the Nazi time, of Hitler and whatnot. So everybody is expected uh, to be submissive and to just obey everything what the government tells them to do. Uh, right, so it's that kind of the dangers. I'm not saying that it becomes like a country like that, but then that's the danger of having, uh, you know, led by an individual pastors uh, with the pastoral team. While there it has its own pros, it has its own cons as well. Okay, failure in proper succession in some cases. I think this is uh, very important to uh, even highlight. Uh, Failure in proper succession. So, what happens if that uh, you know if that leader decides to move on? Um, you know, there could be various reasons, right? Why the leader would choose to move on, okay, to relocate or mission strip uh, and callings changed, uh, or something fatal were to happen and whatnot, uh, and everybody's you know left perplexed. Okay, now what do we do? Because there's no leader, isn't it? Uh, so everybody we can seem kind of lost. So that's independent local churches, um, network of churches. That's another structure we see, right? Network of churches, um, assemblies of God, uh, vineyard churches, new life churches, uh, uh, many others. There's so many more, right? Um, what's it? Assemblies of God. There's. You take South India. For example, Assemblies of God, or just my area, um, the vicinity that I'm living in, the number of Assemblies of God churches that's there. I mean, yeah, so there are a lot of churches. <laughs> uh, Vineyard has its own branches, its network of churches in all these different countries. Uh, or doing, I mean, wonderful work. I, by the way, also, I used to attend uh, an AG church. I come from an AG church. Uh, and that was the uh, first Assemblies of God church. It was the first AG church in uh, Bangalore. I think India too. But yeah, that was like, yeah, anyways. Uh, there are different ways of how each network is organized. Uh, overall, a useful model. Right, you can have a network of churches if the structure that's what your heart is, you can go for it. Uh, in some cases, there is the danger of too much control, uh, abuse, uh, competition among churches within the network. Um, yeah, yeah, so uh, these network of churches will have six, for example, uh, Assemblies of God, uh, it has uh. In, in India, at least, we have a South Indian uh, 
what do we say? We have one person in charge of uh, all assemblies of God Church for South India, and they call it SIAG, right? Uh, South India Assemblies of God Church, and then they have the NIAG. They have Southeast and Northeast and Northwest uh, and whatnot. So there will be a leader, you know, for all those regions and whatnot. And if everybody is uh, happy about the leader, then it's all well and good. And if everybody begins to, uh, you know, have their own uh, reasons as to why I should become the leader of this and something, you know, and then they, they'll start exchanging uh, unpleasantries, which is not nice, right? So apostolic, that's apostolic networks. Um, once again, uh, the next one, sorry, is apostolic networks, a network of churches re relating to an apostle, uh, has the benefit of multiplying a single vision or and focusing geographically a uh, danger of becoming man focused uh, again danger of authoritarianism um, so yeah that's uh, house churches uh, we all are aware of what house churches and house churches and even cell based churches are very similar um, dissatisfaction with large churches uh, or inability to meet in large settings has benefits to of close relationship care and nurture uh, lack of accountability and support if not connected to a large uh, larger overseeing network uh, right so uh, i mean it, uh, sometimes this might come down to a personal preference like uh, saying hey i don't like mega churches i don't like big churches i like small churches where less people uh, so my anxiety doesn't increase uh, i'm also happy Everybody is happy. I can go home early. <laughs> uh, you know, but the con there, as mentioned, is a lack of accountability uh, can be dangerous um, due to limited resources, inability to accomplish in a larger context and impact society in a big way. Right? If you want to, uh, if your vision of the house church is to impact society in a big way. Uh, due to limited resources, that can be a challenge. It's not impossible, it can be a challenge, right? Um, so, yeah, house churches, cell based churches are very similar. Um, one of the points in cell based churches is that the third point danger of splinter groups forming and tearing away from the main congregation uh, has caused some pastors to stay away from adopting this structure, okay? Uh, I mean, this has happened. Uh, it's dangerous. It's very hurting. Uh, it can be very hurting. It can, uh, yeah, it's it's never nice, isn't it? Something like that happens when uh, in a church splits because of a smaller group and whatnot. So that's one of the challenges um, of a cell based churches. Um, mega church. Uh, successful churches soon evolve into mega church with congregations of 2,000 plus people uh, could be denominational or independent uh, churches. Uh, the fourth point there, uh, mega churches are not inherently bad or dangerous. Uh, the same problems affect both small congregations and mega churches. Okay, so some there will be there are certain challenges that are common to all these structures that we see. Okay, and one is basic ones moral failure of a leader um, the leader can fail in a mega church he, he can fail in a small church house group cell group church as well right uh, misuse of funds and so on right uh, misuse of funds can happen in any scale small church big church uh, what not okay uh, character integrity uh, you know um, everything uh, moral failure of a leader yeah it's already mentioned there so um yeah that's yeah that's just some of the common challenges with the mega churches um i would say right so multi-site churches another structure one church with many locations in the city uh, some are across cities uh, provide geographical access to many people uh, give opportunity for many more people to serve and more leaders are raised uh, provides a way of con for congregation to engage in missions easily by planting more sites uh, provides the advantage of shared resources shared learning multi-site churches uh, so guys here's the thing okay we just went through a bunch of uh, structures of churches now it list doesn't end there i'm so i'm sure there are more structures uh different kinds of structure based churches um 
but there are pros and there are cons, strengths, weakness for each model, right? There is no perfect structure. There is no perfect structure. Okay, whatever form of church structure we have or use, uh, we must be aware uh, of and leverage the strengths. We must also be aware of the potential dangers and guard ourselves against them. Okay. Uh, and whatever we do, I think we come back to that same point, right? As we did in the last chapter. Uh, you know, if you want to be relevant, you can be relevant. Uh, if you want to do a certain thing in your church, you can do it. Uh, if you want to use all the technical uh, technical equipments, uh, you know, to modern day and age, uh, whatnot, you can do it. Different methods, you can do it. But then, the foundations remain the same. Uh, let Jesus continue to be the God of your church, uh, and you continue to be accountable to Him. Uh, let that not change, right? Because uh, and we see, uh, you know, methods will change. Uh, principle remain the same as we see in page twenty six. Uh, you know, there was a reformation that took place uh, in the church structure. Okay, uh, a reformation of theology by Martin Luther, reformation of spirituality uh, in the eighteenth century. This changed how our experience, uh, our experience of God. Uh, reformation of structure. Uh, we've seen all these different structures. Uh, come into light in the last 30 plus years or so right uh, before that there was just a certain kind of structure we, everybody followed that and whatnot but at least i think from the 60s on in the west where from the jesus movement uh, began uh, there was a change uh, in the structure of how a church service uh, you know was happening um, so in everything that we do uh, our vision the mission doesn't change. A mission is the Great Commission. The message doesn't change. Uh, we are to still preach Christ crucified. We are still to make uh, disciples. We are still to go out and baptize them, bringing them into our fellowship, our family, of our body. Uh, and with all these denominations that's out there, uh, it's very easy for us to get into this uh, um, spiral of bringing uh, talking uh, ill about another denomination and whatnot uh, you know oh, this denomination doesn't speak in tongues they're bad or this denomination speaks only in tongues they are bad <laughs> uh, we can go on and on imagine if you you know is so i would encourage you from avoid run away from having conversations about that because it's not uh, it's not productive it's a waste of time and whatnot uh, but just just encourage uh, you know each church or denomination to pursue God's blueprint for the local church because church is His idea. We, can, we have to come back to that point. Uh, if we don't, then nothing we do has any point, right? Um, so you guys with me? Yeah. We hope there was something for you to take away from today. Uh, to do a quick recap, right? The, it's just a beautiful journey of how the church, uh, early church, uh, matured and how God guided them, uh, you know, through that season uh, and how they were uh, so uh, reverent, uh, you know, and how they handled things and everything and appointing people, they prayed about it. Uh, um, so there is something beautiful about it and how they functioned together as a team and how they were sensitive to the, you know, the leading of God's Holy Spirit, His voice. Uh, and how seriously they took uh, guiding of uh, of their flock of their church, and how uh, they held themselves highly accountable and responsible for the leading of the congregation. Um, so there's quite a, a lo quite a lot to for us to learn from them. And with all these different structures and forms that we have in today's day and age, I will pick one and just continue to be faithful. <laughs> right? If there's anything that for us to take away, pick one. Continue to be faithful to his calling. Um, and that's that. Okay, uh, let's pray and we'll bring the session to a close. So Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we continue to have to learn about your word from your word. Um, thank you, Lord, that you continue to pour out your wisdom, your knowledge, and your, and your understanding over us. So Father, we thank you uh, once again for this day, your faithfulness, your mercy on our lives. 
I submit this, the rest of the day into your hands. Uh, continue to pour out your strength over us, uh, I pray, Father, over every single person. You would strengthen them in every area of their work, in everything that they touch, Lord, I pray that will flourish. As you've written in your word, Father, you blessed Potiphar's house for Joseph's sake. And so I pray that wherever we are placed, I pray that you will bless that place, that family, that household for our sake, because you are our God and we believe in you. So we bless you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, guys, you guys take care and stop the recording now. See you next week.